That's meant to be our home base, to be able to be this blessing to the rest of the world. That's what God promised Abraham. I will make from you a nation of people and they will be my people in my name, but they will be a blessing to the rest of the world. Welcome to the Pax Christian Church Podcast. We are so glad you joined us today. We pray that this message speaks to you and encourages you and challenges you to live for Jesus with everything that you have. Stick around after the message. We'd love to find out how we can connect with you and be praying for you. Here's this week's message from our Sunday gathering. Today, we're continuing our talk. If, if you heard last week's uh, message, Pastor Mandy talked about how, um, uh, about blessing and about how a blessing, uh, she gave us a definition saying, uh, blessing is a, a proclamation that God has good things for us, our children and for our loved ones. And we are called to bless others. We're called to bless our children and our families and our loved ones. Jesus even calls us to bless those who curse us. She said all of these things last week and it was good. So I wanted to keep it. I wanted to keep that context in. Um, and I added, um, I thought I added a couple more and uh, they don't seem to be there now. So, oh, you know what? That's why I'm on the wrong uh, thing. Here we go. Cool, cool, cool. So um, I still stand by that. But I added a couple definitions there. See, I was in the wrong uh, message. I was still looking at last week's. Um, I can save this event once it starts. When does it start? It should start today. Okay. It says Thursday. Good times. Um, all right. Well, anyway. Um, yeah, it should still pop up. So I don't know what happened there. Uh, I don't know how dates work. It's fine. I do Bible stuff, not calendaring. It's, that's not my strength. Uh, we all have our strengths. That's not mine. Uh, <clears throat> but from Logos, which is a, a, a Christian Bible study app that has all sorts of resources, they had a couple definitions in there that I think helps expand our understanding of blessing in, in good ways. It says, um, in general, like the idea of blessing somebody is a wish or expression or gift for the well-being of another. In cases of divine blessing, it becomes an act in favor of the one being blessed. And so God's blessing is, is not just like a desire. Like when we say like, oh, bless you. Like I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that God is going to bless you, but I don't, have a, I don't necessarily have a ton of authority to, to declare that and like have it stand, but God does. And so when God blesses somebody, that's, that, that's often in material ways, but not just like financial. You don't just look at it and be like, all right, bank account is blessed. Not anymore. Uh, that's, that's not how you gauge blessing from God, but it can include that and it can be reflected in physical things. And he has the power to act in favor or on behalf of the one being blessed. But it, it goes a step further than that in this idea of blessing and cursing and why it's so important, especially when we look at these Old Testament moments where these prophets, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're, they're all prophets who were called to be the forefathers of Israel, God's chosen people. They're speaking prophetically when they issue these blessings. And so when we look at it, it's more than just a like, man, I hope my kid turns out all right. Here's your like, good luck wish, child. It's, that's not what it is. This is a, a proclamation in the name of the Lord declaring how God's blessing is going to be imparted on their children in line with what God has already promised. And so from that place, it's uh, the Lexham Bible Dictionary says, the act of making a binding verbal pronouncement of good or evil on another person or persons. And so then from there, we're called to bless others. We're called to do this, but it should always be in line with, with God's word and with God's promises. And it's only binding when the Holy Spirit has actually spoken it. It's not just like anything I decide to claim and then tag on like in Jesus' name. That's not how it works. He doesn't have to rubber stamp every nonsense thing I come up with. Um, so with, all, with some of that context in mind, I wanna, we're starting in Hebrews 11. And, and some of you I know are, are a little uh, new here or ha haven't been with us uh, all that long, or maybe you've been in and out a bit, especially now that summer's kicking in. Uh, we've been going through Hebrews since January. So if you wanna go back and catch up on any of that, it's on YouTube and Facebook, and we're catching up with the audio podcast on Spotify and Apple and all that kind of stuff. But um, but you can go back and catch those messages if you, if you want to hear. We've been going through all of Hebrews. But when we get to Hebrews 11, 
There's just this rapid fire talk about all of these people and how they lived by faith, what they did by faith. And so we've been kind of taking our time to, to say, you know what? Maybe even if you grew up in church, maybe you've never really heard this talked about beyond like Sunday school, like flannel graph. And so perhaps there's something else to be gained there. And, and then for some of us, maybe you don't have that context. And so this would be the first time you're really hearing uh, some of these things. And, we, and when it says, like we're about to read in Hebrews eleven twenty one, by faith, Jacob, and you're like, who's Jacob? And so we want to tell you about Jacob and, and look at what this is really talking about. Why would the writer of Hebrews highlight this moment of faith uh, to establish part of what faith looks like when it's lived out? So Hebrews eleven twenty one to kick us off. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshiped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Those don't seem like overly impressive uh, things to have done by faith, but uh, I think on the surface, like if I was reading that, like, uh uh-huh, yeah, good for him, and then move on. Like, that wouldn't impress me. Some of the other stuff, it's like, you know, Noah, like by faith, Noah, when he'd never heard of a boat before, was told to build one, and then, you know, the whole earth flooded, and he saved his family and like a whole bunch of animals, and that was it. Like, that's crazy faith. Jacob leaned on a staff and worshiped God. Woo! But it gets better. <laughs> By faith, Jacob, at the end of his life, he takes the time to, uh, in particular, do a couple of things that are highlighted here, and, and they're highlighted at the end of his story in Genesis 47 and 48 and into 49. And the, the first one is he takes the time to stop and worship. And, and it, they're presented by the writer of Hebrews here out of order. But the first thing he does is he, he, he speaks with Jacob and or, uh, Joseph, his son, and, and we'll read through it. And, and when he's done speaking of him and he's confirmed some stuff, he leans and he worships God. And he leans on his staff. And I mean, this is a man on his deathbed. This is, you know, it's not just like, like, oh, you know, and then I stop and pray and I go away and somebody's going to go, by faith, Brian laid his hand on the podium and prayed. It was amazing. No, it wasn't. That wasn't. But, but Jacob, in this moment, he's, he's worshiping and praising God for all the things that have come, that have happened already and the things that are currently going on and the future that is guaranteed because God has promised it. And he's watched all these promises come through and he's, no, he's trusting absolutely with absolute assurance that what has been promised is going to happen and again, for that context, like in faith, faith in this context through this whole chapter is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And we're going to see that, in, and that's from Hebrews 11.1. 1. If you're wondering, you can highlight that. That's a good verse to have highlighted. When we talk about faith, that's what faith is. Faith is not blindly believing in just any random crazy thing somebody says, uh, but faith is confidence in, ho- in the things we hope for and assurance about what we do not see, but we know is going to happen or, or we know to be true because of who God is and we can trust in it. The other thing Jacob does is he blesses Joseph's sons and that's gonna stand out in a moment when we look at uh, their family. And so um, for the rest of our time or most of the rest of our time, we're gonna turn way back to Genesis. Uh, we're gonna be at the end of the book of Genesis a whole lot of stuff has happened. It's a really cool book. Highly recommend reading it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, there's a lot of weird stuff in it. And um, not all of it's good. When you read the Old Testament, a lot of it is narrative. And when you read narrative, it's not all meant to be instructive. Well, it's all available there to be instructive. But what it does not do, the Bible, especially in narratives, is not highlighting every story as be just like these people. It's not doing that. And so when you read through, because I see it all the time, people going like, well, you know, how come you say that God's not for this, but then you totally see somebody doing that and he was the king or he was like the chosen person. Yeah, and he was a moron. The point of that story is to show you like God chose this broken guy who refuses to follow him well, who will not do the right thing nine times out of 10. And he goes, I'm going to use that knucklehead. So when you guys look at the success and blessing that comes for generation after generation, you can't possibly blame it on him. You have to give me the credit. That's God's plan. So, I mean, look, if you really mess everything up and you tend to make the wrong choices, rejoice. God can totally use that. Just 
turn to him. Turn it over to him. Be willing to let go of the control of that and know that God will have his way even if you're not on board. And that's not to say do what you want and it'll be fine and you're blessed anyway. That's not how God works. He will not just endlessly bless you. He will have his will done. You choose to get off that train. That's a, there's a bad road off to the side there. Don't go that way. Okay. But Genesis 47, at the end of Genesis 47, picking up in verse 28, which is on this page, uh, <laughs> picking up in, in verse uh, 28, this is after the, um, so if you're familiar with like Joseph and the technical dream coat and like, you know, all that kind of stuff, like Joseph, Joseph's had a crazy life. He's one of 12 boys from Jacob, who is also called Israel, because at one point, as Jacob is tra uh, traveling, he meets the angel of the Lord. When you read through the Old Testament and read about the angel of the Lord, most scholars are in agreement that it's like 99% sure be, based on what else happens, the angel of the Lord is God. Not just some angel, not just like the best angel. No, you don't become an angel and get to be like that when you die. Like the, he, the, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of God, the word of God, another, I mean, like kind of a loose parallel for that definition would be a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. This is before Jesus is born as a human fully God in man. The, the angel of the Lord operates with the authority of God, receives the worship that is due only to God, and, and, gives, um, and gi gives blessing and proclamation and acts uh, in, in the name of God in a way that the angels speak differently when they speak on God's behalf. And you have times where angels encounter people and they say, thus saith the Lord, blah, blah, blah. The angel of the Lord just shows up and says, I'm telling you this. And people just listen and stuff happens. But, um, but the angel of the Lord at one point encounters Jacob, wrestles with him. Jacob's kind of a punk. And he's just like, no, I'm, gonna do, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. And they fight all night long. And then finally at the end of it, and the angel of the Lord like clearly could overpower him at any time. He chooses not to. He's like, how stubborn is this mule of a person? And he lets him wrestle him all night long. And finally he's like, man, this guy just like, I forgot to put the quit in that dude. Like, I don't know what happened. And so he touches him on the hip is the word used, but somehow or other, he wrenches his hip out of the socket. Like he, he rips his leg out of place and gives him a permanent limp. And then he renames him Israel, the guy who struggles with God. And that's the name of the nation of God's people. The donkeys that wrestle with God unendingly. They just will not stop. The fact that that gets to be his people should, like it does to me, give you a little bit of encouragement and comfort that, whew, man, like, I mean, you got to get pretty anti-Jesus to have him, um, you know, turn away from you because he puts up with a lot. Um, so in verse 28, all of these things have happened and, and, and Joseph has had a time of it. And his, his older brothers, all 11 of his older, or all 10 of his older brothers are pretty horrible to him. Um, but Joseph has ended up as, because his brothers sold him, then lied to their dad, said he was killed by a wild animal. And then they sold him into slavery and he ends up through a series of God working things out. He ends up as the number two guy in Egypt. And then when a famine hits the land of Canaan, the promised land where Jacob and all of his family are, they come seeking help from Egypt and it puts them now in a place of seeking and serving Joseph, fulfilling all of these dreams that Joseph had been given as a child. And, and now Joseph is in this place of blessing and welcoming his family into Egypt to save them from the famine. And then by the end of Genesis, they're gonna get stuck in Egypt in a way that they're not getting out for over 400 years. And when they get out, they're, they're, they become slaves. When they finally do get to leave, then uh, we get to the book of Exodus and, and it's cool. But in this moment, there's this immense blessing and, and this power dynamic that is flipped and, and Joseph is reunited with Jacob. And it says, Jacob lived in Egypt 17 years and the years of his life were 147. So he's pretty old. He was 130 when he finally like rediscovered his son. Like, 
Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being 130 years old and like you're just like, one of these days I'm just gonna like not exist anymore. And you know, man, my favorite son just got eaten by a wolf like you know 30 years ago. That sucked. And I mean, it just, there's no, there's no hope. In him, and there really isn't when you encounter uh, it, Jacob at the end of his life before he rediscovers Joseph. There, there's no hope in the guy. He's just given up on life because his favorite son um, is dying or uh, has died in his mind, um, to his knowledge. So, but now he's been in Egypt 17 years. He's at the end of his life. He's 147 years old. When the time drew near for Israel to die, so, and it's going to switch back and forth between Jacob and Israel, it's the same guy. It's going it just it's going to bounce back and forth with no indication or qualifier. If you haven't read this before, you're going to be like, "Who are all these people?" This is the same dude. Okay? Jacob, Israel, same person. When the time drew near for Israel to die, he called for his son Joseph and said to him, "If I have found favor in your eyes, put your hand under my thigh and promise that you will show me kindness and faithfulness." That's how we all do that, right? Um, that was the thing. If you've ever seen the movie Gladiator, um, I don't know if anybody ever watched that, but they have a similar moment with Marcus Aurelius. It was kind of an ancient world type of a thing. It was one way of placing an oath. You kind of, you, you come near and you, and, and the hand under the thigh, it, it, it's this, it's a pretty intimate position. That's not, you don't just go like tapping people on the thigh like that. That's, um, and so it's this, it, it's this placement of vulnerability and, and it's a handing off of the, you know, there's a little bit of representing the seat of, you know, like I'm, I'm passing along this blessing based on my seat and I'm handing some, some of that off to you and that type of thing. And so there's a, there's a lot of symbolism and a lot of just vulnerability and intimacy there in a very like, this is not just like a knuckle bump. This is not just a three tap bro hug and then walk away. This is a serious, deep moment. And so he says, come place your thigh or place your hand under my thigh and promise that you will show me kindness and faithfulness. Do not bury me in Egypt, but when I rest with my fathers, carry me out of Egypt and bury me where they are buried. And they're both buried uh, in the promised land, in the land of Canaan, where God eventually is going to, um, going to bring all of Israel and they carry Jacob's bones with them um, when they go. So, um, so he says, uh, Joseph says, I will do as you say. Israel says, swear to me, he said. And then Joseph swore to him. And then Israel worshiped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Now you may have a different translation that says he leaned on the head of his bedpost. Anybody got that one? You got NKJV or ESV or NASB or anything other than NIV, it's gonna say that. Um, the word is, the wording's a little confusing there in Hebrew. The lettering's a little, can kind of go a lot of different ways. And it's roughly the same description of either like the, the staff or, or holding pillar of the bed, you know, not just like the headboard, but like the, the post that would, you know, kind of hold up a, a canopy and maybe like some kind of mesh or fabric to keep the bugs out and that kind of thing. Um, and so he's either leaning on that or his staff being a, you know, old man about, you know, on his deathbed, you know, he's leaning there, but he's, he stands and he leans on the top of his staff and he's, and as he's standing there, he's, he stands to praise the Lord. And that, that's the key thing. By faith, he stands and, and I mean, this is a thinking of, of Jacob, the guy who, I mean, was such a manipulative punk. Mandy talked about it last week, how Jacob stole his, his brother's birthright. Um, through false means. What's crazy is God had already told Rachel, or uh, not uh, Rachel, um, Rebecca, thank you. Um, all these R names, uh, getting confused. Um, and Jacob and Joseph and Israel and who's who, okay. God had already told Rebecca that Jacob was going to inherit and Jacob was going to be the one that the line passed through. Jacob was gonna be the one. I wonder what would have happened if he had stopped scheming and just let it happen if she had gone to her husband and just been honest and said, look, you know that we had better listen when the Lord speaks, right? I mean, you've told me about that time up on the mountain with your dad, right? when he was gonna sacrifice you and then there was a ram in the bush and everything. Like, you know that we should listen when God says something. 
And he told me that our younger son is going to get the inheritance. I don't care how you do it, but make it happen. Like, that could have been a conversation, but no. It was, quick, go slaughter a goat and skin it and tie it to your hands and your neck and then, like, come in and try to use his voice. Never mind, don't use his voice. It's like trying to have Kevin Costner do the British accent for Robin Hood. You ever notice that? Like, they had to give up on it because Prince of Thieves, like, he couldn't do a British accent, so they just let him be American Robin Hood. Um, it was ridiculous. And... I mean, like, I don't know if that was the thing. They were like, he, he can't pull off his brother's voice, so it's not going to work. And, I mean, Jacob, has, uh, I mean, Isaac had gone through some, some crazy, crazy, now I'm getting all confused now. Jacob had gone through some crazy stuff, tricked his dad, all of this. He, he was the younger one who was getting the birthright. And then he gets, he tricks his dad out of the blessing as well. And now, in this time, he's looking back and going and, and looking at all of these, all that stuff. And then he got renamed Israel for wrestling with God. He went through 14 years of servitude to his father-in-law to, to you know, pay, pay the dowry. He didn't have a dowry to offer for his wife. And so he, he shows up and, and to pay it, he works for him and raises up his flocks and multiplies them. And, and then his father-in-law is shady too. And they're both just like out tricking each other and, you know, the whole time. And so if you read through a few chapters, there's all of this craziness. And that's how he ends up with two wives. He gets Leah, the older sister, Rachel, the one he actually wanted, and then both of their maidservants. And he ends up having kids through all four of these women. The dude is insane. He has set himself up for just like a life of, ins of just pure insanity, really. He got 12 boys from four different women. Like somebody hit him with a rock early on. I don't know what happened, but... <laughs> And still, God's going to use it. But looking back on all of those things and then seeing how God's promises keep working, even though he at times has done his best to just sabotage all of it, man, he just can't help. He just starts praising in faith. God has done all these things, even when I have gone out of my way to do the worst I can. And still God is faithful. And still God is holding on to his promises to me. And he's trusting and believing and praising God that this promise from his son will come to pass, that he will be buried with his fathers. And he's praising God for that in that moment. So we go to verse 48, or uh, chapter 48, verse 1. Sometime later, Joseph was told, your father is ill. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, along with him. Um, some of you, if you come from different uh, walks of faith, you may have heard that name pronounced Ephraim. Um, I'd love to talk about that, and let's talk about how words are pronounced, because um, I hear that preached a lot, Ephraim, and I still can't figure out how you get there from those letters, but okay. Um, it should be something like Ephraim, uh, maybe, and I, I don't know how you get from that to Ephraim, but sure. Um, but uh, anyway, so Manasseh and Ephraim, that's how I'm going to say it, so just go with me, all right? If that bothered you, you'll get over it. When Jacob was told, <laughs> when Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel rallied his strength and sat up on the bed. I mean, this is a guy who's, I've done, I've done a few hospice visits like that. That right there is a significant thing. If you've ever been with somebody in the end stages of life, when I mean, their, their body is old, they're frail, and they know the end is near, I mean, there's just not a lot of strength there. So like, even just for this, like, he's like, okay, I got this. And he sits up and he's going to do this thing. And he's going to engage with them. And I mean, we're going to see, like, he can't see his body is failing. And he, and he, in faith, is going to engage this thing with intentionality and make sure that he passes on the blessing that has been passed on to him by his father and by his father before him. The promise to Abraham and then to, J to Isaac and now to Jacob and then through Jacob to his sons, the sons of Israel but he's sitting up to bless his grandchildren. He says this. Oh, I don't know what I did. I tapped the wrong thing. I'm trying to keep track of where my notes divert from just going straight through this. And I, sorry, I hit something. I don't know. Um, Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan. And there he blessed me and said to me, I am going to make you fruitful and increase your numbers. 
This is the same blessing that was given to Abraham. So he's recognizing that from the blessing given to his grandfather and then to his father and now to him. And now he's passing that on. So within that context, right? I am going to make you fruitful and increase your numbers. I will make you a community of peoples and I will give this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. And so that's, again, I'm giving this land. At the time he was in the land of Canaan, this is the land of promise. This is the promised land that Israel is looking to and saying, that's meant to be our home base to be able to be this blessing to the rest of the world. That's what God promised Abraham. I will make from you a nation of people and they will be my people in my name, but they will be a blessing to the rest of the world. You will be essentially a nation of priests is what they become, what they're called to be. And what now we, that's part of the inheritance that we as Christians now receive in the line of Abraham from the blessing of Christ that we now grafted in by the Holy Spirit have become a nation of priests, a priesthood of believers, a, 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 a people set aside and holy, but with the ability to bring others into it, not just to sit, sit off in our little towers and laugh at the peasants who don't get to participate, but we, we get to bring people in, into this kingdom, into this family. But Jacob here is, is saying, when I was in Canaan, God gave me the same promise he gave my grandfather. And, and he continued that on. And so one day we will go back and we will do this thing. And he says, now then, your two sons were born to you, your two sons born to you in Egypt before I came to you here will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. Fun fact, Reuben is the oldest, Simeon's the second, Ephraim's the youngest, Manasseh's the second, or Manasseh is the oldest, but he's saying them in order of how he's seeing the inheritance. He's already establishing Ephraim as the, the younger one, as the, the more important one, and he's going to keep doing that. And it's going to bother Joseph, but Jacob's going to be like, I got this. Watch. He says, any children born to you after them, they'll be yours. In the territory they inherit, they will be reckoned under the names of their brothers. But as I was returning from Padan Aram, to, or from Padan, um, to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan while we were still on the way, a little distance from Ephrath. So I buried her there beside the road to Ephrath, which is called Bethlehem. So there's all sorts of cool ties there that Rachel died giving birth to the last promised child of the, you know, the, the um, Joseph and Benjamin are the two kids that, um, are, you know, that come from the, the wife that Jacob married this lady for. Um, that, like that was the whole, all, all the other three were like kind of a collateral damage of like just trying to marry Rachel, this one lady he wanted and all of this and, and these two kids. And, and as she, uh, he's got just the two sons from there and then she passes away and he buries her at this place that later is going to become once all of this is Israel, that's going to be the, the same place where Jesus is born. And it's just a, a kind of a neat tie back to, um, to the connection of uh, you know God's promises and God, God's deliverance. And there's a whole bunch there. We'll talk about it some Christmas. Okay, anyway. But the, the big thing he's doing here, he's bypassing the way things are supposed to work. He should be talking with Joseph about how he's gonna get the inheritance due the 11th born son of 12. But instead, what he's doing is he's going, okay, I haven't talked to any of my other sons yet. I haven't done the will. We haven't done any of those things. I'm going to take your two sons and I'm going to make them mine. He's still only going to give out 12 blessings. But if he adds two sons in place of his one son, that makes 13 or 14, depending on whether or not he still counts Joseph, right? One of them replaces Joseph, so to speak. So Manasseh essentially is going to get Joseph's blessing. Ephraim is going to get the firstborn's blessing. He's going to get the premier first top blessing. Joseph is the one that he really wanted and counted as his firstborn. And in fitting with how their family has been doing things, Abraham first hears the blessing from God and goes, so you're going to do this through my manservant? God goes, no, your own flesh and blood. He's like, okay, cool. Sarah's getting super old, I guess. Uh, her maid servant's looking pretty good. So I'm gonna, and she hands him, her over. And so he has Ishmael through her. And God's like, that's not what I said. It's gonna be your and Sarah's child. 
How much clearer can I make this? Just trust me. And then finally, Isaac comes from that. He's the youngest kid in the family, and he's the one who the whole thing's coming through. He's the one who counts as the firstborn who gets the full inheritance. Same thing goes on with Isaac's kids, Jacob and Esau. That's a whole mess, and everything keeps getting switched around. And now with this, Jacob's like, I'm not even going to go for one of my own kids is the top blessing. I'm going all the way down. In a way, he's going to the firstborn of Rachel, the, the favorite wife, but the 11th born child, and he's going to go through him and call him the firstborn. And of the firstborn inheritance, everybody else would get an equal portion, but the firstborn, so for 12 kids, you would break it up into 13 parts. And child number one would get a double portion and everybody else would get half of what that guy got. So you'd have 13 spots. He's taking that and instead of, uh, instead of breaking it up into 13, he's, still, he's gonna break it up into 12. He's removing one of his sons. We'll read about that in a second. He's removing one of his sons from the inheritance altogether. And he's gonna put, give Joseph a double blessing. He's gonna give him what was due him plus what was due the oldest son and give that to each of his sons equally, counting them as his own. When Israel saw, so, um, well, and so we have that, that statement there, that by faith we declare the goodness of God to those who love and follow him. And that's what's gonna happen here is that by faith, the, our role here, now it's, it's different. If, if God gives you a specific blessing to speak, that's one thing. But like, like I said at the beginning, we can't just like walk around just being like, in the name of Jesus, I declare Ferraris in my driveway. And like, that's not how that works. Um, we don't just get to claim whatever we want. Um, but when God says it, and when God sets it up, he can do it however he likes. And so he does it like this. And it's almost always to show his glory, not ours. He doesn't want us to lose sight of the fact that we didn't earn this. We don't deserve it. And not in a like, just remember, you don't earn this, you don't deserve this, anything. But in a, you couldn't do this on your own. And when you try to do it on your own, if I don't remind you, and, and I mean, he does it kindly and gently, but if he doesn't remind us, then I don't know about you, but like I easily start taking credit for everything good in my life. And, you know, even in ministry, it's real easy to move from like, wow, look at what God is doing to, I am pretty good at this. I am, I have done very well. And I, I, I'm, I'm really getting the hang of this thing. And I am, I'm a good preacher or worship leader or whatever the thing is. And it's okay. Some of you are like, no, no, no. Um, God chooses it. God does it. And he shows himself strong in our weakness, which is really a blessing and a better testimony anyway. Because it's not, you had to be good enough to qualify for this. It's, you can do it too. Any good thing that's coming, anything that's impressive that you see, it's a blessing from God. It's a gift from God. And, it's, and anything that's going well right now, it's all because of ways that I'm following God. And if you see something that's not going well, either he's going to use it anyway, or it's somewhere where I have stumbled and, and failed to follow him well. I'll take credit for the things where it's messed up and give the glory to him. In Romans 9, 15 and 16, God, it says that God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. And so all of this comes from God's mercy, God's plan, God's effort. Let's get to this blessing. They're the sons God has given me here. Joseph, oh, sorry, Ooh, skipped one. When Israel saw the sons of Joseph, he asked, who are these? Because he's blind or nearly and he, Joseph says, these are the sons God has given me here, Joseph said to his father. Israel said, bring them to me so I may bless them. Now Israel's eyes were failing because of old age and he could hardly see. And so Joseph brought his sons close to him and his father kissed him and embraced them, kissed them and embraced them. Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, but now God has allowed me to see your children too. I mean, what a, what a cool blessing, right? I mean, he had no idea he'd get any of this. Then Joseph removed them from Israel's knees and bowed down with his face to the ground. And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim on his right toward Israel's left hand and Manasseh on his left toward Israel's right hand. Does that make sense? That was kind of backward sounding, but so Israel's sitting here and from Joseph's perspective, from your perspective, this is my right hand, but it's on your left, right? Yeah. And so he goes and he's like, 
the right hand is the hand of blessing. The left hand is the hand of like less blessing. And so he's, he's like, all right, I'm going to put Manasseh right here and I'm going to put Ephraim right here. So dad can just put his hands out, put his hand, hand on their heads and bless these kids the way they should be. And, um, and so he, he did that and he brought them close to him. But Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head though he was the younger. And crossing his arms, he then put his left hand on Manasseh's head. So now he's sitting like this. This old man is sitting like this. And Joseph's just like, senile old man, what are you doing? Like, he, he's, not, he's not cool with this. Um, and then he blessed Joseph. So he's sitting like this. And now he, and he blessed Joseph. And he said, may the God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, walked faithfully, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm. When he says the angel, he means the angel of the Lord, the one he wrestled with, the one who has kept him in place. And, and you can tell because he's using, he says, the God before whom my fathers walked, the God who's been my shepherd, the angel who delivered me, same person. Why do I know that? Because the next line, may he bless these boys, not may they. He's talking about one dude, God, Yahweh, God the Father, who is, has shown up as an angel and wrestled with him directly and various things, as well as um, the God that his fathers walked with and the God who's been his shepherd. It's all one person. Um, may they be called by my name and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly on the earth. And that blessing is absolutely going to happen. When you read through scripture later, Ephraim becomes somewhat synonymous with the northern kingdom of Israel. But later when the kingdom splits and the southern kingdom is referred to as Judah and it's made up of two of the tribes, Judah and Benjamin, the northern 10 tribes are often either referred to as Israel or Ephraim. Ephraim becomes synonymous with either the northern kingdom and or all of God's people at various times throughout scripture, especially in prophetic language. So this blessing does take hold. When Joseph saw his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. So he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head and to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to him, no, my father, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know. I don't know how he said it. He was like, I know, my son, I know. Bring me on. I don't know if it was like that or if he said, I know, my son, I know. He too will become a people and he too will become great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he, and his descendants will be a group of nations. And he will be blessed, or, and then he blessed them that day and said, in your name will Israel pronounce this blessing. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. And he's declaring like, man, even when people bless you, when people bless you, they're gonna claim the blessings that were on you guys. When they talk about when later, when people bless each other, they're gonna be like, oh, may you be blessed like them. He's like, that's the kind of blessing I'm, I'm laying on you two. And so he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. And then Israel said to Joseph, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. And, you, and to you, I give one more ridge of land than to your brothers, the ridge I took from the Amorites with my sword and my bow. And so then the next chapter he goes through and he blesses the right, he calls in all of his other sons and he goes through the blessing there. And he tells them how, um, he says, Reuben, you're my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength excelling in honor, excelling in power, turbulent as the waters, you will no longer excel for you went up onto your father's bed and onto my couch and defiled it. And that's a whole thing you can read uh, in Genesis, which, um, but Reuben gets pulled right out of the inheritance line because he went and slept with one of his dad's wives. And, um, and Israel's like, yeah, nope, none of that, none of that for you. Not just because of the sexual impropriety there, but also because it was an act of trying to usurp his father's power as leader. And so the double whammy there, he's like, you are completely out. By faith, though, Jacob kind of brings things back into line, redeems the, the plan here, establishes his children, uh, two of his grandchildren in place of his, um, you know, their dad and, and Reuben. Establishes this, um, this blessing in a way that God is leading him to. By faith, he looks at the promises that God has given to him and he looks at his two grandsons and he says, through you guys, God's going to do this thing. 
I'm going to continue claiming this blessing and promise that God has given. By faith, we declare the goodness of God over those who love and follow him. By faith, we praise God and declare his blessings over those who love and follow him. And so as we head into, um, we're going to head into a time of communion here in a moment, and it's going to be a little different because we've got the elements up here instead of, um, it, it, normally we have them in the back and we ask you to grab them as you come in. But today we've got them here. And so what we want to do is give you an opportunity to, while we're in the midst of worship, and I do want to ask, like, don't just like bum rush it right away and just be like, okay, I'm going to get this over with. Man, communion, should, it, it's not snack time. It's not something that we should rush through. It's something that we should take time and, and seek God and, and enter into the presence of God and remember the promises that he's given us. Communion is a reception of and an agreement of a covenant that Jesus laid out for us. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread and he, he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup of blessing and when he blessed this, the cup of blessing in the Passover meal, he said, this is the blood of a new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. This is those who believe in Christ will never die. Those who believe in Christ are redeemed and forgiven. This is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And we should take some time to, to seriously um, dwell on that. We're going to sing a song that kind of walks through communion. And, and so you, you can um, take some time to, to pray and sing. But these promises for us, there's no promise of great tracts of land for you. Sorry. I know we live in a place with lots of land, but like, that's not the, don't walk outside and be like, all right, in the name of Jesus, I'm claiming that one. Like, that's not how that works. The promises Romans 10, 8 to 13 says, what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this all through a God who sent his son to be born as a human, to live a sinless life, and then be crucified unfairly and unrighteously. But he put himself in that position so that he could pay for the sins of all humanity. And that sounds crazy. 1 Corinthians 1, Paul acknowledges that. He says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where's the wise person? Where's the teacher of the law? Where's the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through all of its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. God is pleased to save us as we place our faith in him. Thanks for listening today. We hope this blessed you and that God spoke to you. We'd like to connect with you. You can find us at paxchristian.church and fill out the digital connect card or find us on social media as Pax Christian Church on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. If this message spoke to you today, would you consider sharing this message with someone? Maybe tell a neighbor or a friend. Maybe leave a review and let others know what this has done for you. May you be inspired and transformed by God's spirit as you step out into this world to declare that there is peace with God for everybody through our Lord Jesus Christ.